And we're glad you are with us this morning, and I'm glad uh, to be back with you. We are continuing our series this morning in Joshua. We're in Joshua chapter 7. If you are on a device, we will be reading from the New International Version. If you want to know where we're at, you can check uh, in the pew. There should be. If anybody needs any of these, you can take notes, and our bulletin information is on the back. It, we're on page 173 and 174 in your Bibles, uh, in the pews. And this morning, I'm calling this message, this next one in our series, The Ripple Effect. And you'll understand a bit more about that as we move on. I'm only going to read the first few verses because just to kind of give us the setting of where we are going to be this morning. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Cammy, son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them, so the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon, to the east coast of Bethel, and told them, Go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not, and, and do not weary the whole army army for only a few people live there. So about 3,000 went up, but they were, and I love this word, routed. They were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. And let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to be here this morning, to be exposed to your word. And God, I pray as we look into your word this morning that it will also look back into us and that for having been here, that we will not just be informed, but we will be transformed. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. It was August 28th, 1963, when Martin Luther King Jr. stood there in front of the Lincoln Memorial at the Civil Rights March to actually give his what's now the famous I Have a Dream speech. Every Martin Luther King Jr. Day, people will recite it. You will see it, of course, reposted on Facebook and YouTube and all of that. It was an absolutely remarkable speech, but I don't know whether you know the real story behind it. Uh, Dr. King was only supposed to be one of several speakers that during that event. He had literally was had a speechwriter that was working with him, and the speechwriter actually was working all night. Now, what the problem was is that when Dr. King sat down with his people, he said to them, I want to put the dream part in there. And they go, no, 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 Dr. King, we are not you're not doing the dream stuff. You've been repeating that. We're, we're not going to do that. We don't want you to talk about that. We're taking that out. And King says, no, no, I want it in. And they said, no, no, we're going to keep it out. And so as, as the story goes, about 4 a.m. in the morning, he got the final draft of the speech. If you watch it on YouTube, you will notice as Dr. King stands to deliver the speech, he is looking down and he's reading, and it's very halted in the beginning. Now it's not uncommon for an African American preacher to start out very, very slow and then to reach a crescendo. That's how they do it in their churches. But it was sort of halted. If you watch the video close, and I can't remember which mark it is, it's somewhere around the 10 or 15 minute mark. You all the see him all of a sudden see him take his script and he moves it to the side and he said, I have a dream today. And then he started. Now, what happened that day was one little thing. King was not getting cranked up. And usually, if you've never been into a black church, I was just celebrating the anniversary of one of my friends Tuesday night. And buddy, if you haven't been to one, you can get caught up in it. I do. I love it. I mean, they will talk back to you. They're, they're, they are they are worshiping, you know, and I love it. And so we, so usually they, they talk back. And so all of a sudden as Dr. King is reading this speech, all of a sudden down a little far enough away from him where he can still hear it, Mahala Jackson, a gospel recording artist said, tell them about the dream, Martin. <laughs> and they said some of his associates went, oh. He's not going to do that. And then he moved it aside. And that one decision is credited with that one speech of moving the Civil Rights Act in 1964 ahead. The ripple effect of one decision. It's amazing, isn't it? 
We've all seen the ripple effects in our life, the good stuff. You know, you decided to go for a particular job, and you, man, you wondered about it, should I do it? And then you went for it, and you got it, and you were like, yes, this is great. Or you made a particular investment, and it was good. Or you asked that person to go out, and you wound up having a great relationship. But we've also seen the problems, the bad ripple effects. When we may have cut corners and cheated, when we may have lied about that one little thing, when we maybe stole something, thinking that nobody else was really going to see it and nobody else is paying attention to it, and after all, it didn't hurt anybody. It was between me and this person, and then suddenly the ripple effect starts and you watch it go. See, here's the thing. It's like when I used to throw the rocks in the water. The, the decision represents our, the, uh, the rock represents our decisions. It's like the rock is neutral, and so is the ripple effect. It's depending on what you're throwing in the water. So if you throw a good decision in, the ripple effect is good. Throw a bad decision in, the ripple effect is bad. The thing is that I want us to understand today is, and, and this is the, the sermon subbed up. Now, I don't want you, you know, summed up. I don't want you to get up and walk out now because I'm giving it to you. But this is it. Choices create consequences. Choices create consequences. And that's the story of Joshua chapter 7. Now, I don't think that choices, even though the consequences have been negative, that you can't come back from them. And we're actually going to see how Israel handles this. So let me give you the setting. In case you haven't been here, and I know I wasn't here last week, and so, so we didn't do anything on Joshua last week. I don't know. Andy Stanley was on a different wavelength than me last week, so he did something different than I did. But we were, we've were we been in the book of Joshua. Those of you that haven't been with us, we saw how the Israelites have been wandering for all of those years, and 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 God had been preparing Joshua and Moses told Joshua, you're going to take over when I'm gone. And Joshua was tapped on the shoulder and God said, you're the guy. And we saw him lead them into the promised land across the Jordan River. We saw them build a monument to God so that he said, years from now, when your children say, what do these stones mean? That you're going to tell them how I delivered you. And then we saw right before I left, wasn't here last week, we had looked at the battle of Jericho over two weeks and we saw how the, the walls came tumbling down and Rahab was saved. But then we talked about how God had, had dealt with them and all of the killing and it seems like this violent God was involved and we saw that at the end of Joshua 6. But if you remember in the story, and we read part of it here by way of introduction, God had told Israel, listen, I'm delivering Jericho to you. I want you to go in and save Rahab. I want you to go in and take all the gold and all the silver and all that stuff, and we're going to put it into the treasury of the Lord. You're not supposed to keep any of it for you. In fact, it was called the devoted things. They were things that were going to be devoted to God. Well, if you read along with me, you saw that one guy, Achan, was like, And he picked some things up. And we'll see in a little bit. He took it and he buried it in his, under his tent. Now, we picked up the story that, that then, and, and this is where I want you to see choices have consequences. Choices create consequences. Because if you see what happened... Achan takes that. So then, so then they got another little battle. And isn't it always what happens? We have a victory. Everything's going great. We get kind of arrogant about ourselves. And we think, okay, I can do this, man. I can, I can take a bullet. This will be great. I can, we can do this. So they said, Joshua said, uh, well, now, what should we do with AI? And they were like, some of the generals were like, listen, Joshua, listen. It's, just, it's not like it's going to be a little skirmish battle. Just don't wear everybody out. It's going to be nothing. Just go in and, and send a few people in. And we'll wipe this thing out and take care of it. And everybody else can rest. So we'll, we'll just send in the specialized team and we'll get this done and, and we'll be out and everything will be finished and we'll move on. <laughs> so they go into what should be a simple little tiny battle. You've done that before. You've got, okay, this is no big deal. I'm just going to win and do this and take care of it. And have you ever had that happen and then everything goes sideways? You think, this is going to work out. I got all this planned. Everything's fine. Everything went sideways. And literally it says the Israelites were routed by this small little group of people. 
and a bunch of them got killed. Now, we could, we're going to pick up the story where Joshua was like, uh, okay. So notice what happens. Verse 6, he hears this because now the Israelites are fearing this little group of people from Ai. And Joshua doesn't know why. He can't figure out why. So notice it says, And Joshua tore his clothes, verse 6, fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and he remained there until evening. So this guy, Joshua, lays down on the ground. He's laying on his face before God. He's trying to figure out what, he, what is going on. And so the elders of Israel did the same. They sprinkled dust on their heads. And I, I love Joshua's prayer. I'm going to read it like I think it went down. Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country, listen to this, will hear about this and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. And then he says this, what then will you do with your own great name? What? Did you, did you read that? Joshua, Joshua's laying down on the ground and he starts praying. He's like, oh Lord, we, this happens after a big defeat, defeat right? After things didn't go your way. You start to like, oh, Lord, it's not worth it. We should have never come across here. And, and you know, now we look bad, but I love the last part. It's, I'm going to paraphrase it. It's like, not only do we look bad, but guess what, God? You look bad. You're the one that called us out to do this. And now we get routed by, you take Jericho without us ever having to, to fire anything. We went in, you dropped the walls, and now we get routed by these people. God, this is not our fault. This is your fault. Now, remember, Joshua had told them, whatever you do, don't take anything from Jericho. Because if you do, it's going to have consequences. So Joshua's praying, feeling sorry for himself. He's a little upset, so he goes to God and he tells God just how bad things are. And tells God, now I'm worried about your name. What are you going to do? And I love what, what God says to Joshua. Notice what he says. The Lord said to Joshua, verse 10, stand up. What are you doing on your face? Israel has sinned. Now stop there. But he's praying. He's spiritual. No, he's procrastinating. Did you know that sometimes prayer can be procrastination? Because you already know what needs to be done and you already know what is the right thing to do. But then you say, I'll pray about it. And it sounds so spiritual. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray about it. And people go, oh, they're so spiritual. No, but if you already know what you're supposed to do, now you're using prayer as a procrastination or as an excuse to not do something. So, so he tells them to stand up and then he says, they violated my covenant, which I've commanded. And by the way, notice what he says. Now, now remember, who was the person that took this stuff? Achan. Achan. Not Israel. Achan. But one of the things we've been saying throughout it, we will continue to say, is what? Choices create consequences. See, we think that our decisions only impact us. God said, Israel has sinned. Israel has sinned. They violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They've taken some of the devoted things. They've stolen. They've lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they've been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Oops. I think somebody's mad. Because it was so easy. God said, don't take the stuff. 
It's kind of like the Garden of Eden. Don't eat of this tree. You can have all this other stuff and I'm going to take care of you. But nope, don't, don't take it. It's, it's God's, don't take it. And now he says, guess what? The consequences have impacted the end. Watch the entire nation. Choices create consequences. So Joshua does, I got to give him credit. He goes to God. He's evaluate, we're trying to evaluate what's happening. And so we should do that. But then here's what God says to him. He goes, all right, now go find out what's happened. No, he doesn't. He says, watch this. Go consecrate the people. Tell them, you consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You can't stand up against your enemies until you remove them. So God says, I'll tell you what I want you to do. He said, I want you to go to the people and I want you to tell them to consecrate themselves. Set themselves apart. Get themselves right spiritually because the next decision that's going to be made is a real important one. The next decision that's going to be made, they may not want to make. Because I said anybody should be destroyed that takes the devoted things. I told you that it was going to be destruction. There's going to be a difficult time coming. So everybody needs to get on the same page and dedicate and consecrate themselves. They need to get right before me. That's the problem. So Joshua goes, he does all of that, and notice what happens next. He tells them that they're in the morning, they're going to present themselves tribe by tribe. Uh, then he says, verse 6, 15, whoever's caught with a devoted thing shall be destroyed. Listen to this. this. This was the warning. I want you guys to get right before God because he says, whoever is caught with the devoted things will be destroyed by fire along with all that belongs to him. How many of you would be like freaking out about now, you know, if it had been you? You know, and you're hoping they don't get it wrong. Like, you know, so... Uh, along with all that belongs to him, he has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing in Israel. An outrageous thing in Israel. So early the next morning, Joshua comes forward. Now watch this. Had Israel come forward by tribes and Judah was chosen. Now, how long did this process take? I have no idea. He had Israel come forward tribe by tribe by tribe. Judah comes before him. Now notice what happens. The clans of Judah then come forward. He has the Zerites were chosen. Then he had the clan of the Zerites come forward by families. And Zimri was chosen. And Joshua had his family come forward man by man. So now Joshua's drilling down, drilling down, drilling down, investigating, drilling down, drilling down, drilling down. And then he says, the, then, he says then Joshua said to Achan, My son, Give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me what you've done. Don't hide it from me. Wow. Can you imagine Achan's waiting? Because <laughs> he said, listen, the person that did this is going to be destroyed by fire. They're, they're basically going to be executed. They're wiped out. There's no, there's no mercy here. This is it. Because they were told not to do it. And so Joshua looks at him and says, okay, son, tell me what you've done. Achan replied, this reminded me of my kids when they were little. It is true. You ever have yet with your kids? I remember, I can't tell you how many times it's like, did you do this? No. Then, yet, you know how us parents are. We know that they did it, but we want them to admit it. So you play with them psychologically, which is my kids will never be right mentally. But, but you, you, know, you, you, you play with them a little bit and you want to get them to admit it. And it's like, and I remember having a situation with Josh and Lauren where finally, finally, and that's exactly what Lauren did because she had set him up. And I said, I, finally, I, I got out of her. And she goes, I did it. I did it. That's what I see Aiken. I did it. It was me. It was me. I did it. It was me. Please, no more. You know, I can't, I can't take the torment anymore. So he's like, no, it was me. It was me. And I think he's probably still thinking he's going to get out of this. But then he, notice what he says. I have sinned against the Lord. Oh, well, you're sorry, Aiken. That's good. You know you've sinned. Oh, that's nice. Uh, this is what I've done. Then he lays it out. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I, notice when he's, listen to how he's admitting his sin. I coveted them and took them. 
They are hidden in the ground inside my tent, and the silver's underneath it. Now, I want you to notice how Joshua investigates this, because you have an admission. You go, I did it. I did it. It was me. The Joshua then sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. Wow. Yeah, he, he apologized, though. I mean, come on. I mean, really? I mean, he took some stuff, but it was not like he took it from Israel. It, he took it from one of their enemies. I mean, come on, this can't, you know, really. Surely this is going to be reversed because, I mean, he said, I'm sorry. And he did confess. And he said I was wrong. I mean, really, we... <clears throat> they took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites, and spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua, together with all of Israel, took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold bar, his sons, his daughters, his cattle, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have you brought this trouble on us? Ouch. Your choices have created consequences for us. Why have you done this? And he said, the Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel did what? Remember when they had to consecrate themselves? Remember God is, we, we said before, because this sounds harsh, because God's building a nation. And it was a nation of laws. And if the laws were broken, even though you said, I'm sorry, like my, my kids used to keep giving, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. But guess what? There are consequences. Because we're living in an age today where people don't know consequences. There's not consequences for actions. And so we see that happening more and more. There's no, there's no more consequences, it seems like, for the actions that people take. So they all Israel stoned him. And after they stoned the rest, they burned them. Over Achan, they heaped a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Now notice this. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since. Yeah, I wish there was a happy ending. That's it. That's it. For now. See, here's, here's the problem. When you hear a good ripple effect... You know, good ripple effects, we see them, and it's a good thing. And so when we have a good ripple effect on our life, and there's a good thing that happens, and we made a good decision, and the ripple effect spreads, it's a good thing. And so we have to repeat that good decision. The problem is when we blow it. The problem is when we make that, that bad choice that creates consequences, because some, often we think, we think our choice is not going to impact anybody else. Could you imagine your one choice impacting an entire nation of people? We could go through history where we talk about people who have made decisions that have really literally impacted history. And had they gone another way, things would have been different. Things would have been totally different. And there are, there are, are points in history where we see that decisions were made that changed everything. Because the lesson that we take from this is not that, oh, somebody sins among us, we take them outside the church walls and stone them. No, that's not what it is. God was building a nation. That's not how he operates today. But the thing that we have to understand is we are going to make choices that are going to create consequences and things are going to get really sideways at times. And the question is, what do we do? There's a process that occurred here that I'm going to give them to you really quick and I'll be done. And, if, and I kind of tried to point them out a little bit at a time. The first one was evaluation. When you've got a ripple effect that's negative, you've got to stop and probably get on your face before God and God may say, it's time for you to get up. Here's the problem. You can sit here and pray all day, but the, it was good that Joshua's first sort of response, which is often our last resort, he went to God. 
But when he, but when he went to God, he went to God sometimes like, oh, dear Lord, why is this? It reminded me, I used to watch Hee Haw growing up, you know. I don't even remember Hee Haw. They room this bear and agony. You know, they sing this. Everybody's kind of, oh, how tough my life is, you know. And, and so this guy, Joshua's doing a little bit of whining. He's not really at this point evaluating yet. He kind of goes to God. We do that, don't we? We're like, God, how come my life's so bad? How come this stuff always happens to me? What? And God says, okay, stand up. There's a problem. So we do have to stop. If we've, if we've made a choice and the ripple effect has been negative, we've got to evaluate. Now, and so you notice that they, they sort of did that, that sort of when things deteriorate, we evaluate. And then, then you saw the next thing they had to do was not act, the next thing they did was what? Consecrate. They stopped and they got themselves right before God and said, before we move on, before I go next, I got to make sure that I'm right before God. After that happened, what did they do next? Then they drilled down and investigated. And they did not leave until they found out the real reason. They found out the cause. You know what we do in our culture? And we just, we watched it happen recently. It doesn't matter where you stand on either political side. But I don't know whether you know that recently, uh, with all the stuff that happened with Justice Kavanaugh, that now another person came out yesterday and said, oh, I lied. I, I lied about him raping me. I mean, literally confessed to lying. And we are not in a time today where people investigate the truth. You have got to get to the truth no matter what. Whether you agree with it or disagree with it makes no difference. Truth is truth. And so he drilled down and drilled down. And literally, could you imagine the investigation process of going through every tribe of Israel? And then you go from here, and then you go down to this. You get all the way down to this, to this family. Then you get down to the individual men in the family. And then, and then God looks, or, uh, Joshua looks at Achan and goes, what's up, man? Let's talk. They investigated. You see, if you don't take care of what the initial problem was and what your bad choice was in the first place, you are doomed to do it again. And the final principle, you go, oh, I'd like to see what you're going to do with this. Well, they wiped everybody out. Real simple. The principle for us is that when we find out that we've made a bad decision that has created a ripple effect, that has hurt other people, we need to then eradicate. We need to get everything eradicate out of our life. It could be friendships. It could be people. It could be stuff. A lot of times it falls into these four categories that I, that I like to talk about. There could be hurts that have caused us to hurt other people. There's a saying, Rick Warren says, hurt people, hurt people. And so if we don't get rid of our hurts, we're going to make negative, we're going to have negative consequences that are going to have a, a, when we make these negative decisions, that are going to have a ripple effect on other people. So our habits, let me tell you what, you start and the habit can get destructive and I've, I've saw it happen recently. Somebody starts a drug habit, creates neural paths and it wound up in suicide. Create a new neural paths and they're, and they're gone. And I'll be hearing the same story this coming Saturday when I speak at the Florida Initiative for Suicide Prevention. The same thing, a habit starts, it's not eradicated, it's not taken care of and then boom, it's over. Consequences. Hang-ups. Our hang-ups cause us to make bad decisions. Because we've got hang-ups about what happened in our past or what somebody did to us or, or maybe how we grew up and all those different things. And so we have hang-ups that we can't get rid of. Those hang-ups cause us to make bad decisions, which then create a negative ripple effect. So we got to get rid of that. But then there's the, the, the fourth H in that is humans. There are people that are in our lives that probably shouldn't be there. That's a hard thing. Sometimes we surround ourselves with the wrong people. We wonder why. How come I don't ever get ahead? Well, look around because you become the sum total of the five people that you're around the most. You say, well, what do I do if it's my mother? <laughs> well, don't talk to her. No, talk to her. But, you know, be, be nice, you know. Be nice to mom. Make sure that you're, you're, choosing, you're choosing to be around the right people. Because it's going to impact you. I love that verse in Corinthians. It talks about bad company corrupts good morals. You're never going to bring them up. Most of the time, they will bring you down. We tell our kids that. We careful who you hang around. What about us? We're subject to peer pressure too. That's why church is important. 
I, you know, I, I, we were, I was talking with some folks this week, again, about church and all of that. And I said, well, we will have, and it's pretty traditional now, you'll have more people viewing stuff online than will come to church. And I agree. I think, I think it's good that we have to be out there and be online. But I need to be a part of a community of people that are encouraging me. I need to be able to be here where I've got positive influence, where I know that if I walk in here, even though I may disagree with you, we're family, and you can say anything you want to me, but you're not going to let anybody say anything else about me because we're family. You know how that goes, right? So that's, that's, what, that's what this is about. We need this type of a community. We need, this, we need this in our lives because we have to have that kind of encouragement. We have to have that kind of, those kind of people around us. And so that's why I think this is so important. So it's important to remember today that choices create consequences. Just imagine that if before every decision that you're making in your life, that if you just paused... And it's hard because we want to react so quickly now. We're in this instantaneous age where somebody says us something and we're like, ha, got them. And then afterwards you go, ooh. And folks, we see this happening from us all the way up to the Oval Office. By the way, it didn't, it's not trickling down from there. I, it, we have an election coming up. And everybody keeps talking about how our leaders, our leaders, folks, they are a reflection of us. We, 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 we elect them. This did not start yesterday. This didn't start yesterday. This slow, I can be whatever I want to be. I can say whatever I want to say. I don't, there's no consequences for anything that I say or anything that I do. And you can't tell me what to do. That's where we're at today. And it started years ago. Because choices create consequences. Just imagine if we paused. And we said, I'm about ready to throw this rock in this pond. Is the ripple effect going to be good? Or is it going to be bad? You say, God, that's, that's, that is a hard, hard thing to bear. It is. It is for all of us. I know that the choices that I make when I'm out in public can create consequences for you. I could say something, they'll go, oh, that was your pastor again, huh? <laughs> you, you understand that you do that with your family on a microcosm level. You do that with your spouse. You do that with your children. You do that... You know, my, my dad used, my dad, when I was growing up, I said, how come you didn't, how come you didn't name me Junior? You know what he said to me? My dad was a smart guy, street smart. He says, because I never wanted you to have to live up to my name, nor did I want you to tear it down. Because he would always remind me that when I was at school, when I was at work, that he knew people in town and that I was a reflection of him. We don't teach that anymore. But you know what? If you know Jesus, you're a reflection of him. And your choices create consequences. Let's pray.